Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Laura Prada from our Telesur Studios in Caracas, Venezuela. We we'll begin with our news. You stay with us. We begin in the Caribbean, in Guyana, tens of thousands have mobilized at Lusignan in support of the People's Progressive Party Civic on Saturday. The PPC staged its final rally ahead of general and regional elections this Monday as it is seeking to return to power following a narrow defeat at the 2015 polls. Supporters were promised increased pensions, the restructuring of the petroleum sector and a government that seeks the interests of both the Indian and African diaspora. The position has also urged citizens to vote peacefully and uphold the law in, its, in this critical election as billions are at stake following the country's massive oil fines. Meanwhile, the ruling uh, Partnership for National Unity and Alliance for Change Coalition also held its final rally on Saturday. Prospective voters sported green and gold t-shirts and flags in support of President David Granger. Cultural displays and musical performances were also put on ahead of the candidate's speech. Amid loud cheers from the thousands present, President Granger, who is seeking re-election for a second term in office, detail his vision for the country as he tweeted his proposed decade of development. And this Monday, the Cooperative Republic of Guyana is holding general elections to renovate parliament and choose a new government. To remain, two main political forces dispute a scenario difficult to anticipate. Let's find out more on the following story that our special correspondent Alejandro Kirk sent us straight from Georgetown. On December 2018, the ruling coalition of Guyana lost the one vote majority on which the government of President David Granger was based. Elections should have been called for within three months, but it took 14. It's now 14 months, going on to 15, since the no confidence motion. And this government remains fully in office, exercising authority and spending money on contracts and projects and using that money to campaign with, which is totally illegal and improper. The main contenders are the ruling Partnership for National Unity and the People's Progressive Party Civic. Both held massive closing rallies on Saturday. We are going to return our country to constitutional rule. We are going to safeguard democracy. We are going to expand our infrastructure, transforming our country, our economy and our people. My sisters and brothers, I am the man with the plan. <laughs> Profits from our petroleum industry will provide you and you and you and you with a good life. Both movements claim to be socialist, but as is traditional in this former British colony, the vote will tend to follow rather ethnic lines with ideological issues of the past somehow vanished. None of them are socially. These are terms that are bandied around, right? Um, when, you, when you hold them on some issue, they tell you about pragmatism. As far from the trade union perspective, pragmatism is opportunism. Both parties have moved to the right or to the middle, but they move from the left towards the right. So the if you were to define an ideological difference between the two major contesting parties, there is none. Key in this electoral dispute is who will be in charge of managing the wealth to be collected from massive oil production that has not yet even started to flow. Marcos da Silva and Alejandro Kirk, Telesur, Georgetown, Guyana.
And from the Caribbean, from these images, we move on to Argentina, where President Alberto Fernandez has opened a new legislative year with a pledge to protect the interests of the nation during negotiations for a debt agreement a deal with the country's creditors. He said any deal the country reaches with its creditors must be sustainable and one which helps to end the cycle of indebtedness. Fernandez's administration hopes to renegotiate 195 billion U.S. dollars of its 311 U.S. billion foreign debt, including a deeply unpopular 57 million U.S. dollars bailout loan the Mauricio Macri administration obtained from the International Monetary Fund in 2018. The most important thing is that the agreement we reach with creditors be sustainable. We need an agreement that allows Argentina to stand up and not fall back. That is non-negotiable. If we want to forever overcome the cycles of indebtedness, we must assume commitments that can be fulfilled. With this information, we go for a first break. Remember, follow us on Twitter at Telstra English and on my account at Laura Peterson. You stay with us. Pakistani journalist Tariq Ali examines the mass media influence promoted by imperialism. Get access to the analysis of the socio-economic and political life of the whole South America on our screen and platform in English. A critical place committed to the truth to determine the major events that transform the world today. Mondays, only on Telesur. We are back with our news. Vivian Luis Arce, the presidential candidate for the movement toward socialism, the Mass Party, on Sunday held a mass rally in the city of Santa Cruz, where he called on his compatriots to unite to restore democracy. Addressing the multitudes who turned out for the rally, Arce said the unity of the masses will defeat the right-wing politicians behind last year's coup. According to the latest polls published by local companies such as uh, Atlas Electoral and Taxi Noticias, 79% of response would vote for mass candidates. We change topic in Chile. They continue taking to the streets, protesting against inequality and demanding a new constitution. This weekend, thousands of people demonstrated at the capital, Santiago de Chile, despite heavy police repression. Demonstrations have, that have left more than 30 people dead first broke out on October 18 last year, initially against a metro fare hike, but quickly transformed to wider anger of social injustice. A United Nations report's release is in December accused security forces of committing gross human rights violations against protesters. In Chile, human rights are being systematically violated and the response of the people to that is to have an organized front line. People are strongly defending those who are behind the front line, so they mobilize peacefully. The front line plays an extremely important role. We change topic. Luis Lacalle Pou has been sworn in as president of Uruguay, putting an end to 15 years of rule by the left-wing broad front coalition. The center-right leader of the National Party came out as winner 
of last November's runoff elections, beating candidate of the Broad Front Party, Daniel Martinez, by only 37,000 votes. The success of La Calle Post's campaign owes much to his ability to unite five parties, ranging from center to far right under the multicolor coalition. His government wants to cut government spending and liberalize the energy sector in order to tackle the country's fiscal deficit. Under the previous government, Uruguay introduced free health care and education, legal abortion and same-sex marriage among other progressive policies. And as we were saying, we have more details on Uruguay, new president in this following story. Let's see it. This Sunday, a new president takes the reins in Uruguay. The right-wing liberal Luis Lacalle Pou will take over and put an end to 15 years of left-wing government, years in which the country saw levels of economic growth and reductions in poverty and inequality that would be the envy of many. Data shows that the country's gross domestic product has grown 126 percent per capita in the last 15 years the highest in all of Latin America. Official figures show that Uruguay has had 17 years of uninterrupted economic growth. GDP had the highest growth in its history and it stands at $56.9 billion. Net debt is just 32 percent of GDP and the country has $14 billion in reserves. Unemployment has fallen from 13 percent in 2004 to 8.5% in 2019, poverty from 40% to 8% and extreme poverty from 7% to just 0.1%, making Uruguay the most equal country in Latin America. I think the macroeconomic situation in Uruguay, compared to the rest of Latin America, is particularly good, and in terms of general development, not just economic growth, which may be a necessary condition, but not a sufficient one. Uruguay has seen big improvements in the quality of life. Although these numbers have been praised by many local, regional and international bodies, the Uruguayan people decided in favor of a political, economic and social change. A decision many say came because the left put all its efforts into managing the system and forgot about political work. The citizens want to be involved in the changes the new administration makes, but I don't think that will happen because of pride. Perhaps a good government was not enough. This doesn't win you an election. You can have the greatest administration and lose votes because this is a game of politics. The Frente Amplio Party has not yet conducted a post-mortem of its three years in office to determine the reason for their electoral defeat. An official review is expected to be conducted following municipal elections in May, while the country will now be reeling from the return of neoliberalism. And from Uruguay, we change topic and we update about the coronavirus. <laughs> Thailand has reported its first death from the novel coronavirus. The victim was a 35-year-old man who worked as a salesperson and had contact with tourists, was first admitted to hospital for dengue fever in late January and was later diagnosed with COVID-19. The man was tested negative for the disease days before his death, but health officials said that he remained in a serious condition due to organ damage. Thailand has 42 confirmed cases of COVID-19 at the moment. Meanwhile, the Caribbean has recorded its first few cases of the coronavirus, three of which has been confirmed in the French island of St. Barts and French St. Martin. The cases were confirmed by a laboratory in Guadalupe, 
which is conducting tests for the COVID-19. The victims are residents of San Bartolome and his visiting parents who were attempting to leave for Paris but were handed over to airport authorities after presenting with symptoms of the illness. Their conditions are said to be stable. Staying in the Caribbean, health officials in the Dominican Republic have reported the first confirmed case of COVID-19 in the tourist-rich Caribbean. Public Health Minister Rafael, Rafael Sanchez Cardenas said a 62-year-old Italian man had arrived in the country on January 22nd before presenting with symptoms. He is now being treated in isolation at a military hospital and has not shown serious complications. Health authorities said the broader Latin American region has been reported several other cases of COVID-19 illness. Mexico has reported four cases, Brazil two and Ecuador one, all involving people who had traveled recently to Europe. Meanwhile, China's National Health Commission says the recovery rate of COVID-19 patients is increasing. In the past week, the cure rates of confirmed cases in the city of Wuhan, the province of Hubei, and the whole country have been increased continuously. The nationwide cure rate has reached 52.1 percent, which means the epidemic situation of the country has maintained a positive trend and medical treatment has gained obvious effects. The medical pressure is being reduced in the next stage. We will focus on the risk brought by the overall reopening of business and the continuous increase of infections abroad. A United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, has said the World Health Organization decision to raise the COVID-19 risk assessment to very high should not cause panic but lead to concerted efforts to contain the outbreak. This is not a time for panic. It's a time to be prepared, fully prepared. As WHO Director General Dr. Tedros said, the greatest enemy right now is not the virus, it is fear, rumors, and stigma. Now it's the time for all governments to step up and do everything possible to contain the disease and to do so without stigmatization and respecting human rights. We know containment is possible, but the window of opportunity is narrowing. Like this, we go for another second uh, break. You stay tuned with us. Innovation, science, the technological breakthrough and its influence in society. Viajeros del saber, el futuro está aquí. Ataman. Monday, only on Telesur. But with our news, Malaysians have reacted with mixed feelings to the swearing-in of new Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin. Muhyiddin was sworn in at the Malaysian palace after getting the support of several opposition parties. Malaysia was plunged into turmoil a week ago when former Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad's reformist Pact of Hope alliance collapsed after a bid to force out leader in waiting Anwar Ibrahim. Mazarir then quit triggering a race for the premiership, which he oddly madly lost to, to little-known Muhyiddin Yassim, 
who heads a coalition dominated by the country's ethnic Malay Muslim majority. Meanwhile, Malaysia's ex-leader Mahathir Mohamad has said he felt betrayed by Muhyiddin. Betrayed, mostly by Muhyiddin. He was working on this for a long time, and now he has succeeded. And dozens of people have been injured after Israeli forces have opened fire on Palestinians protesting against the construction of a new Jewish settlement in their village near the occupied West Bank city of Nablus. The residents had gathered in, in Beteya village to prevent Jewish settlers from encroaching on their land. Health officials confirmed that several people with serious injuries, including a 16-year boy who was shot in the back by Israeli troops, have been evacuated to hospitals for treatment. Meanwhile, a day before Israel's third parliamentary election in one year, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is threatening to annex more Palestinian land if re-elected. Speaking during a radio interview, Netanyahu said annexation of the Jordan Valley and other parts of the West Bank was hit top, his top priority. Last week, Netanyahu announced plans to build some 4,000 settlers' homes in the annexed East Jerusalem building of the Jewish settlers on occupied Palestinian land is illegal under international law and has been condemned by numerous United Nations resolutions. We move on. Afghan citizens have welcomed the looming withdrawal of the U.S. military from their country and are ready to receive Taliban fighters back home. Reacting to the deal between United States government and the Taliban, which will see foreign forces move out of Afghanistan, the citizens said they see the Taliban fighters as their, as their brothers because they share the same values, religion and culture. Meanwhile, hundreds of Lebanese have, be, have braved the recent coronavirus outbreak in the country as they continue with anti-government protests. Despite the recent confirmed third COVID-19 virus case in Lebanon, the protesters more protective masks and marched in the streets towards the country's Ministry of Finance and Parliament. The demonstrations started on in October last year, 2019, with protesters calling the resignation of the government they accuse of being corrupt. Meanwhile, in Turkey, some 13,000 migrants have gathered at the Turkey-Greek border after Turkish government last week allowed refugees passage to Europe. Turkey's decision comes after an air strike by Russian-backed Syrian forces on the city of Idlib in the neighboring country last week, killing 33 Turkish soldiers. Greece has stopped firm not opening its side of the border and deployed additional border guards. Turkey's MUF temples on a 2016 deal struck with the European Union to stop the flow of refugees in exchange for billions of euros. But the European Union never really paid up. And on Sunday, President of Lesbos Island set fire to a disused migrant center after blocking dozens of people from disembarking on a nearby beach since last week, locals have protested and clashed with riot police on Lesbos and Chios. In Slovakia's opposition, Onalo party has won Saturday's general elections. Preliminary results indicate that Onalo, headed by Igor Matovic, has won more than 24% of the vote, while the ruling as Merge Social Democracy Party, led by former Prime Minister Robert Fico, was second with 18.9% of the vote. Fico has conceded defeat and congratulated Matovic, who has already begun negotiations for a coalition government with other opposition parties that managed to win parliamentary seats. 
And like this, we come to the end of this youth prep. But remember, you can find this and much more other information on our website, TelstraEnglish.net, where you can read opinion articles or watch the special interviews. So you continue with us with Telesur, always together, connecting our global thousands. Next time, thank you for watching.